tonight the Cosmopolitan Club, the student project for Amadea Mount Nation and the lectures committee would like to present Dr. Regional Smart, the director of inter international education uh, at State University College at Buffalo, New York. Dr. Smart was director of international study at Lake Erie's College and he will have spent seven years as the director of international ministry in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Smart holds degrees in architecture and, and theology and received doctorate degrees in social ethics from Boston University. His article on international ecumenical ministries appeared in fall 1968, Exchange. His booklet, Global Village Conversation, is extensively used by volunteers uh, who work with foreign students and, vol and visitors. And uh, another article titled Turning Into Now But Don't Drop Out appeared in summer 1971, Exchange. We are fortunate to have Dr. Smart with us tonight. The topic which Dr. Smart will talk to us tonight is uh, getting through in, in spite of ourselves. Uh, after the lecture, we're going to have a few minutes for answer the question. And at 10 o'clock tonight, we're going to have a, a workshop that at Black Center. So anybody is invited. Uh, we are the Cosmopolitan Club also uh, sponsor a retreat in 4-H camp on November 18 and 19. And uh, if you want to sign up, just sign up in the Mandela Memorial, Memorial Union. I'm very pleased to introduce you. This is Dr. Dr. Rizano Smart. face was at the mic, not at you. I always like to take my watch off if there's not a clock because I've heard that some preachers used to say that they complained somewhat if the audience started to look at their watch during a sermon, but when they actually held their watch up to their ear to see if it had stopped was the time that they really knew they had to stop. I don't want you to have to do that, so I'll keep my watch in front of me. I used to say that I uh, hope you'll understand my accent, but that's gotten a little better as the years have gone by. Uh, I'm still not completely uh, reliable. I will sometimes even lapse into saying uh, schedule and even occasionally, uh, as I gather one of your presidents once said to the very saucy Australian Prime Minister Menzies, who'd been complaining that you Americans don't really speak properly, um, the, prime, the president said, well, I don't know, at least we are reasonably consistent because uh, I'm surprised you don't say sure. Well, I say sure occasionally because of that silly statement. I'm here to talk a bit about communication. I guess to talk to people who are somewhat realistic about the fact that communication is not automatic nor is it easy. And therefore, I think it's most important that I say something about what to me are the most basic difficulties in communication. And I think that they are the big differences in our values. These values, among the values that divide us, none are more basic or none is more basic than the way we value ourselves. People feel that they're valued sometimes because of what they are and sometimes because of what they do. North Americans and most even young North Americans, because they've been affected by the Protestant ethic, are great doers. When they're confronted with some situation, they usually consider, first of all, what to do in response to it. A bright senior, for instance, a year ago, walked into a group set up to explore relations between US and foreign students, and he immediately asked, what are their problems? As in the ethos around him, pragmatic concerns dominated. But the most important question he was quickly told by two or three articulate foreign students was, not your question, what needs to be done, but what do you need to become in order to reduce the problems that foreign students have on your campus? 
considering he was the editor-in-chief of the college paper, that was a rather important question. But it took almost an hour before he began to see that foreign students really were more concerned with what he was than with anything he could ever do for them. Now, if we value a person for what he does, many things follow. Work and play, for instance, are seen as opposites. Work is considered virtuous, and play is what you get for working. It's a reward. It's what you do in your, quote, spare time. One's for adults, the other's for children. Some of us like to think that we're still children in some way. After all, you don't get paid to play, supposedly. But my experience in negotiating contracts, and this is the most important of the things I do, in many countries, it has been that the contracts are essentially negotiated, except in one or two countries. They are negotiated over a drink and over some good food. They're negotiated over the small gifts that you bear when you bring to people. They're negotiated, in a word, not by the objective merits of the project, but by the relationship which develops between you and the other people. As I guess it was um, John Chancellor said a couple of nights ago that uh, the gentleman from American industry who was in Europe at the moment, uh, sorry, in Russia at the moment, had made a gift of a Goya worth a million dollars. That's a lot of money for a visitor to spend on a gift, said Chancellor, but you must remember that the business he's looking for is worth several billion. So that was aptly put, even if it sounds a little cynical, it's rather realistic. And yet, in America, and in my state, New York, my employer categorically refuses to give me a dime for entertainment when I go abroad. And when I first had difficulty about this, when I put in one of those stupid expense returns, the answer given to me was, well, that's play, and they only reimburse you for work expenditures. I thought that was rather short-sighted, but they weren't in the communication business, I guess. But if this kind of categorization gets in our way, how much more do some other ways in which we value a person? My return to the small Australian town where I was born last March provided a striking example of how different societies accord status to people. I am probably the best educated and most widely traveled in that little town. I'm, by some standards, the most successful person the town produced. But at the same time, I'm divorced and I live apart from my three children. And these two pieces of behavior are absolutely unacceptable to the natives of that town. Yet when I was back in March, everyone accepted me warmly, without any hesitation. You know, just warm, open smiles. No kind of, well, try to pass you by and then, oh, you've got to recognize the guy so they say hi. No, warm acceptance without pretense, without reference to my positive or negative achievements. Why? Because they all love my father. And when I got a bit upset about this, I happened to be a couple of days later looking through some old papers that Dad threw at me and said, what are you going to do with this stuff? And amongst other things were some references that were given me when I was 12, 15, 18 years of age from the mayor and from the school principal. And they read something like this. We commend Reg Smart because his father is one of the most outstanding citizens in our town. Well, I must confess I'm enough of a Yank to have been really angry about that because I really have this basic American value of feeling that I should get credit for what I do. Another way in which this value gets in the way for us is that others don't necessarily ascribe value in a democratic way. Some think that this practice of ascribing status, like I've just said, is really undemocratic. But think of what that US word means, democracy. It's laden with a whole host of other values. 
To be democratic here, you've got to first of all put the individual before the group. Then you've got to reward each individual for what he does, judging the value of what he does according to some impersonal standard which you apply to everybody who's in this kind of competition. And when it comes to decision making, you always act according to the wishes of not all the people, but at least half the people plus one. On the other hand, some of us know that you can have rule by the people while putting the group above the individual. Democracy doesn't mean putting the individual above the group. You can have democracy without a built-in fight for ascendancy, and you can have it by reaching compromises instead of decisions. Two obvious examples are the traditional ways in which the Ga and West Africa have governed themselves and the ways in which any Quaker meeting operates, even in this country. By the way, have you noticed how much we value competition? Don't you, don't I, play a better game of tennis or ball or even golf when we've got some competition? Have you ever honestly wondered why the US in world sports seem to dominate? I don't believe that it's sheer physical superiority. I suspect that it's the expertise that's honed by competition which is just simply not present in most societies. Sometime, if you've got a chance, I gather they used to do it, watch some foreign students playing a game of volleyball. The more drop balls, the greater the fun. And if you're unathletic, you can be the most popular person if you just laugh. How different that is from a gawkward 11-year-old American kid who sits on the sidelines and keeps the scores of all the great, not major league players, but other kids his own age. This is just so different. And when foreigners of many, many countries, in fact, most do compete, watch their difference in style. Now, don't point to East Europe. I know that's another ballgame. But on a soccer field, for instance, a group of Chileans look more like a group of court jesters and jugglers who have accidentally invaded Buckingham Palace at the changing of the guard than they look like a typical college football team who's going out there to win. Or again, foreigners in Buffalo are always dropping into my office assuming that I can and will make an exception of their friend or relative concerning either admission or money. And when I talk about fairness and justice and I've got to apply the same norms to everybody, they just don't understand that. They kind of look at me and smile and they say, but gee, you know, I know so-and-so on the faculty or I know the president or I know you fairly well, don't I? And we've been on a friendly basis for two years or five years. They just don't understand this notion of fairness. And I just don't communicate with them because they value objective rights and wrongs much less than personal relationships between us. And they don't understand why I'm so topsy-turvy in my values. Well, these are just some impressions of the kinds of values which separate us. But I indicated at the beginning I want especially to look at one value, the way in which the self is valued. And I want to do it in three types of cultures, traditional, modern Western, and youth. They're, like all of these kind of things, artificial constructs. But most cultures of the world today fall more or less into one of these and far less in the other two. And I think for the sake of understanding, it's easier to think about them if they're as if they were discernibly and completely different. And I also suspect that most people here and most people you meet would readily place themselves in one of these. I also choose these because they are really, for most of us here, the dominant groups either with which we deal, if it's youth culture or modern Western, or, I believe, the group with which we need more to deal, namely the traditional cultures.
for I believe the world sorely needs the contributions that those societies can make if we're going to deal with the big issues of peace, pollution, poverty, population, and because I like alliteration, I use the word pride. And of those, I think I'd say the worst is pride. These differences in the way we view the self are, I think, at the root of most communication difficulties. And I believe each contains something that the other needs if the world's to be a lot more fit place for our children to be born into. I'm not going to labor the points by spelling out communication difficulties which derive from them, because I think that you're intelligent enough to think up the instances for yourself as I try to describe these three views of the self. The best way to find out how a person views the self is to ask a stranger, to ask that person to describe himself. And I'd like you to imagine a stranger asking this question of an African farmer in Uganda, of the male president of the PTA in Middletown, USA, and of a 25-year-old at a rock music festival. The answers you get will give you some idea of how they value the self, how these three cultural types, traditional, modern, western, and youth cultures, value the self. I've tried this, and I've been amazed at the common patterns which come through in all the answers that each gives, and how different the one is from the other. When I hear those differences, I marvel that any of us in one of these three groups ever communicates with the other cultural groups concerning anything that really matters to us deep down. The African farmer's answer will probably go something like this. I'm Lugubra. I come, that's the name of the tribe. I come from such and such a place. My mother's so-and-so. One of my uncles is so-and-so. You must have heard of him. I have three older brothers and a younger sister, and so on. He talks about his family. His self stems from being part of a social group. The PTA president, on the other hand, says, my name's Dick, Richard Thompson. I work in computer sales. I'm regional sales manager for IBM here. I'm president of this group of parents, who, and he goes on to talk about what that group does. His self stems from being independently what society rewards. The rock addict will respond in terms like, my name's Dick. I guess the most important thing is I do my own thing. You know, my own thing. Mine's collecting electronic music, living in an experimental commune, and sitting in the real warm sun. What's wrong with you, man? That's what it is. I do my own thing, and one of my things is just sitting there and soaking up the good old sun. His self stems from what he regards as individual integrity. Now let's look at these in a bit of detail. The Lugubran farmer from Uganda would explain his behavior in terms absolutely strange to most of us. Anger, says one of his proverbs, is like a stranger. It does not stay in one house. So an anthropologist, Middleton, described his behavior after being justly offended by the insulting behavior of his son this way. Then this man goes home. He sits and thinks, if I complain at the shrines, the ghosts will do that son of mine much harm. So he sits and thinks, but he doesn't say any words at the shrines. But the ghosts, his father and his father's father see him sitting and see his heart is heavy and that he wails. They think among themselves and bring sickness to that son. To say words with the mouth at the shrines is bad. If a man or elder says words thus, his child will surely die. But if he does not say words, the child becomes sick and learns to obey his father, but he will not die. It would not be remotely accurate to say that this is how the father deals with his anger. This is how tradition has taught him to think. There's no question of whether this is right. There's no question of choice. This is what he does. Compare a father in a Western country that any of us could imagine. One who simply blows up and beats his kid. He says, it's my right if I feel like it to beat him. 
Or think of another who carefully considers what response will be best for his son's development and how he should deal with his own psyche so that this doesn't rub off and damage the child and so on. Now these are both concrete extremes here. But no matter how a man in this society responded, it would be in reference to a self which is imagined to be free and autonomous. How different from the traditional man in the Lugubrian tribe. His response isn't even his own, but integral to destiny and to that of all others around him, past, present, and future. And his destiny even is not something related independently to him, but something determined by the good and bad parting that his spirit made from deity when he was born. How difficult for us to grasp what that means. We tend to say, okay, that's how he explains his self. Not so. Only the outside observer would even say that, for the phrase explains his self, assumes a separate self. And such a thought never occurred to this traditional man. And why should it? For he's as scientific as you are, even if you've got a PhD in some scientific subject. His explanations of experience and that's what it is, an explanation of experience, seem perfectly satisfactory to him. Our concept of a mind, internal to each one of us, is just as mythological as are those things with which he explains what happens. The mind is not to be found by any surgeon or any postmortem. The mind, which is at the base of all our assumptions about self, is as much a construct of our imaginations as of his spirit. Each is a social construct which explains experience. How crazy then for us to try and argue such a man out of anger, to tell him that it's bad, or to try to discuss with him the rights or wrongs of child abuse. And yet that's what missionaries and the like have done for years. And even Peace Corps people sometimes fall into that. Like resentment, so this man would explain things such as memory and even his most personal non-physical experiences. All of them are the action of some external agent, whereas we attribute all these things to something that's the emanation of, some, of the mind within. To turn to another aspect of this traditional self, how does this man know something? Not by analyzing it or observing it, but by becoming one with it. His self cannot objectively say that something is so. His self only knows something by becoming the other. A rather extraordinary Vietnamese woman once said to me, and I quote, if we're to know something, it's not enough to have a record of the impressions left on the camera of our mind. She continued, in the analytic approach, to know a flower is to submit it to all sorts of physical, chemical, biochemical analysis, and to draw a sum from all of these and say, here's the flower. In our approach, she said, to know a flower is to become a flower. To know a person is to become that person. To know the Vietnamese is to become Vietnamese. To know the Viet Cong is to become the Viet Cong. To know Mao or Ho is to become Mao or Ho. We believe that no matter how tight the analytic net that you weave around an object, it can only catch the forms of the object and the essence always slips through the stitches. However thick the net might be, the result is only a reflection, not even of the object, but of ourselves can't help but say, as a philosopher, she'd never read Kant, but that's Kant. Of course, this approach to knowing takes time and detachment from other things. So we should expect such a person, how many on this camp? We should expect such a person would need to get himself together fully in a new situation before he or she would feel he knew it well enough to respond to it. And that means lots of time for reflection and the attainment of the oneness that I've been trying to talk about, rather than lots of talking on the assumption that there are objective things to discuss with these poor new foreign students. 
Little wonder that Indonesian ambassador Sajak Moko commented two years ago that the most overwhelming single fact about American social life is the amount of talk. He said it's all the time. There is never silence in this country. We don't give a person from a monistic background time to get his self together. He might well be thinking that we don't ever get our own selves together either. And such a difference, I would note, though, is a bit more likely to give me trouble than most of you in my audience who are 20 years younger. Because somehow or another, this point has gotten through to you that getting yourself together may be the most important thing but some more of that a bit later. The traditional culture's life lived as part of one unbroken web causes enormous problems when communication is not through words but through action. And the most striking example of which many, many people have spoken to me occurs in sex. In some traditional societies, a man attracted to any unmarried woman he's just seen naturally makes amorous overtures and if she responds, they make love there and then, maybe within 15 minutes of meeting. If asked why, he would say that it was necessary, that he'd have felt guilty not to have done so, somehow or another lesser man. Not to have done so wouldn't be a denial of self, but of the life force which he feels flows in and out of him, between and around all living things, and to which he must respond. The lack of such feelings or the inability to express them are for him causes of mourning. How different is that from the young Western religious woman's response, and I quote one, but I've been told this by many girls, such lascivious men. They just think of women in terms of their lusts like animals. Her response, you know, is reasonable. If you think in terms of separate selves whose well-being is tied to virtues such as love or consideration for other separate selves, to virginity or to private conscience and so on. But his response is equally reasonable in terms of his value. And while the people who rub shoulders today are rarely, and especially on this campus, are not such narrow Westerners as that girl, although some girls probably come to campus that way, or such primal men, and I know some of the guys might seem to be that way occasionally, the value systems of most non-Westerners on this campus and of most Westerners stem from just such systems, although less clearly and less strongly held. Now, all that I've been saying about traditional man and his self is terribly artificial precisely because the self isn't part of his consciousness. But I chose to pursue this awkward description because it is central in the consciousness of the other two groups, Western and youth cultures. So let's look at one of these, the American PDA president. He introduced himself, first of all, by his own, not his family name, or his group identification. He went on to define that individual personality of which he's so proud, by telling us how far up the ladder he'd climbed, the business ladder, and he told us that his devotion to public service had made him president of the PDA. Now, he'd deny, if you pushed him, that any of those achievements were to win the approval of his wife, the esteem of his kids, or popularity in circles that he held in some kind of awe. Yet he would admit, if you pushed him, that his wife was kind of a new woman since his promotion. And that Jonathan stage whisper, that's my dad, kind of ranked even with his own sense of achievement when the PDA ballot was announced. He would deny, of course, what is equally true, that the love of his family is in some ways dependent upon his having made it. And he'd argue all night against any claim that his standards are not really his own but are much the same as those of any other 35-year-old junior executive. After all, read the analyses which are done lots of places of Playboy, that it really is telling this group what their standards ought to be and how they ought to manifest the way they've made it, whether it's in the jacket they wear 
in the way they organized the decor of their home or anything else. And he would give some characteristic remark about pretentious academics if anyone suggested him to be a perfect example of the anthropologist's statement that, I quote, the US ideal of individual autonomy means free to be like everyone else. Of course, the whole social fabric helps him to avoid realizing that. He has ideas of his own, his own ideals, his individual style, and unlimited potential in his own mind. And because he has his evidences of real freedom, and he's, n he's never, of course, therefore told what to do. You don't tell children in the American school or in the ideal way of rearing children, you persuade them what is best. You don't tell people how to vote, you persuade them, and so on. By learning what does and doesn't pay, he eventually conforms because he decides to do so. The path is different but the result is indistinguishable from the result in a traditional society which has no concept of self. And it's the same as the result in a highly authoritarian culture where you learn quite early to be quiet and do as you're told. We imagine that we decide out of our own enlightened self-interest. We know they're compelled by a denial of their freedom, evil. This contradiction between the ideal of individual autonomy and the reality of group conformity creates amazing inconsistencies to which Americans are blind. We communicate in terms of self-interest, and even ads must appeal to what benefits the viewer, or at least to what he wishes he could enjoy if he had the money, or if he were 30 years younger with greater powers one way or another. We don't think ideologically, because that would require, and I note this especially in Iowa, a rich farmer to face the contradiction between his fear of socialism and his demand for an increased grain subsidy, or his share of social security, or the GI preference that his son can get, or Medicare, or a tax write-off on his oil dividend. As a result, most North Americans find it almost impossible to identify and communicate with a person who is dedicated to an ideology which is followed through systematically from beginning to end, or a person who places an extended family's welfare before any narrower self-interest. Every week at this time, WOI brings you The Local Scene with George Jelinek. A WQXR production, The Local Scene, came to you from New York. To those who must relate to such Americans. The American thinks of himself as somebody in a context and he expects deference in that context, while he will toe the line in another. For instance, you always introduce a speaker by giving his pedigree, as if that amounts to anything. The best pedigrees are often followed by the dullest speeches. I pray this isn't one of them. But in America, a person is not seen as a father by his third in command. He's seen as a boss. And that subordinate will respect him as a boss, regardless of the stories about what he does to his wife and kids. These are treated as separate. Cooperation is with the part of the self which is relevant. And if that fragment is acceptable, then all these other things are ignored. Even major personality clashes in this society can be submerged. Let's forget our differences, an engineer will say to another. We both want to get this dam built, don't we? To the traditional farmer or to the rock addict, I don't think that's the issue at all, because at least ideally, both of these relate to total selves. So because of convenience, contradiction, a system of rewards, and the ambiguities of a complex life in Western culture, the self must remain vague and ambiguous for us to live with what others see as denials of it. Little wonder, then, that many middle Americans hate the kids who want to define the self. What else can you do with someone you can't afford to hear? And that brings me to the third way of valuing the self, the youth culture approach.
I think youth culture starts with the conviction the individual is free to build his own philosophy and values, his own lifestyle and his own culture from the beginning. And the beginning, rather like the middle American, is the self. But it's not a self-ideal that comes from religion. It's not, in the Kennedy style, a self which will best serve the public interest. It is not a self which will best preserve and in turn be preserved by man's finest institutions, such as family, government, education. The self with which youth culture commences is just the mixed up bag I call me. A rock addict is sure that his essential self comprises the way he feels when lying in the sun, when discovering a new mix of electronic sounds, and when he really grooves in his commune. He comes to this conclusion in an attempt to be just what he is, honestly and genuinely, and he seeks wholeness for that self. And he accords that right to others. That's okay, he says, that's your thing, just like rock's mine. In my school days, the odd kid was really persecuted. Now one finds him affectionately called my freaky friend because rejection is rare, simply because persons are not measured by given standards but valued for what is unique in them. I recall I always socialized with the kids who were labeled brainy, the high achievers. Today's groups are unbelievably varied because classification and comparison are rejected. Each has his own individuality and excellence in one area doesn't make him better, for each has his own kind of excellence. Therefore, background and achievements are neither of them critical. This produces openness and community based on such a thing as a simple ability to say, I felt lonesome, so I came looking for somebody. Compare that to the extraordinary lengths to which most adults use to find companionship the singles bar, the friend-seeking cocktail party, and other social life with its acceptable but so artificial conversation, which always goes to any lengths to avoid letting the real me show. And the language of this culture expresses their approach to the self. Your own thing, loving, teaching, all you need is love, soul, blackness, and so on. Yet, we older folk aren't allowed to be and to let them be, even though that's what they claim. For they do seem to seek confrontation. And many people see that as a contradiction of their approach to the self. Each has a right to be his own man. Why confront us? I think because this is the only way often that is open to affirm the self in the face of all the other denials of it. For things like pot and different dress and sexual standards are declarations more than anything else of independence. They're used as ways to say, I am I and not what you wish I were, some substitute self who will never be able to get along in society, uh, or who will always be able to get along in society better than the real me would. The more articulate consider that formal education is essentially an obedience training school where the tests measure more than anything else your performance in accordance with social norms like obedience, submission, substitute satisfactions, and so on. These brighter ones often object violently to being called top students. Some of them even make sure they get lower grades so that they won't be. And I remember one not so bright student who came to me one day to complain about a C-plus paper. It took me a whole hour to argue her out of the second sentence after she walked into my room. But I'm worth more than that, Dr. Smart. I'm worth more than a C-plus. She didn't say my paper is. She said, I'm worth more than it. And ever since, I've wondered whether for all my protestations, I might really be grading the person as a human being when I assess a student's work. For after all, what you communicate isn't necessarily what you intend, it's what the other person hears. So such a search for self occurs in spite of all the givens in a young person's life. And to develop this needs privacy and sovereignty. One needs the time to think, 
than the freedom to try things, to search, to explore, to err. Older folks are inclined to say, kids have always done this, it's nothing new. But I think the difference is that in the past they've been effectively, they've been effectively socialized very quickly. We've created a jargon for the way we do that. As a result, we have an identity crisis when a 16-year-old is forced to reject the sense that the real me is a surfer or a folk singer on the grounds that those aren't real vocations. You can't become a professional surfer. How many people can be professional folk singers? And we've said instead, you've got to discover a role and you've got to be that. Now go on, cut your hair, get good grades, use good grammar, work hard, and then argue other people down and get your satisfactions, just like I do, out of being a successful lawyer. New youth is more inclined to say, even if I become a lawyer, I'm damned if I'll allow myself to be imprisoned in what society usually expects of those in that profession. I will not be less human as a lawyer, but more. In the face of what he sees as a social straitjacket, it's therefore a little wonder that the basic part of his sense of self is just that very ability that he finds he has, even if it means taking no bath for a month to startle squares like me. And if this sense of self is equated with startling status quo people, our rock addict will work all the harder to startle you if you try to stop him, or if you ignore him. For as I said earlier, he's essentially saying, notice me, not as a reflection of yourself, nor a high achiever, as society will reward, but notice the real me. Now each of these views of the self is an integral part of a value system and a style of life to which I've referred vaguely. Each different view of the self is bound up with equally different politics, personal habits, and ethics. We usually fail to see that that's the case, that such things are part of a whole, and we usually fail to see that their origins these different personal habits stem from essentially different views of the self. For example, consider how different is the ultimate ethic that underlies each of these views. Traditional societies have said, conform and you'll be happy. The Judeo-Christian tradition, and seeing my audience is mainly youth, let me warn you, the chances are 10 to 1 you belong in the modern Western, not the youth culture category. The Judeo-Christian tradition inherited by most of these modern Westerners has said, reach for the ideal and you'll be rewarded, here or later. The new generation says, and the reason I've said what I just said a moment ago, and it goes on saying all its life, let each realize his own potential and all will be happy. Traditional societies reward and punish appropriately to this basic ethic. Those who conform are rewarded. Those who do not conform are punished. They establish no ideals that you can separate out, so they have no conscience in the sense that the Judeo-Christians know. And we in this room are mainly Judeo-Christians in our ethnic tradition. There's simply the way it is done handed down with embellishments and all kinds of sanctions, but so internalized in growing up that the alternatives that most of us know never occur in traditional societies. It all works very well in traditional societies as long as they're isolated. On the other hand, this Judeo-Christian tradition began with the idea of a kingdom of God on earth and or in heaven. Marx agrees completely with Isaiah, with Jesus, and with Jefferson about this. Its inevitable built-in quality, however, which is both our glory and our curse, is that there's an impossible dream involved in this. The earthly culture which determines our lives must always be squared with these aspirations that are way up there. We fool ourselves in the most elaborate ways 
because we can't bear the fact that they are way up there and we're just down here. And it seems that today, increasing numbers of people can find no way to square up there with me here than tranquilization. And God preserve us from making that universal. Societies within this tradition reward and punish in line with those ideals which characterize the kingdom of God, whether it be the earthly one of Karl Marx or whether it be the vision of an Isaiah or a Jefferson. And so everything works out more or less as it should, as long as it too exists in isolation. The new generation thinks both of these tyrannies, the tyranny of conformity, traditional man, the tyranny of aspiration, Judeo-Christian tradition, both of these tyrannies seduce men into being less than human. The new generation thinks that free man should have no master without or within. He says, let each be what he can, but not at the expense of others. So they dream of all men becoming fully men, regardless of what holy cows stand in the way. This is not a new privatism. Its dream is of all men being full members of the human community. And I think that's evidenced by new styles of communal living with which they experiment. But, woe betide those who don't conform to their idea of rejecting tyranny. As a result, their system too could perhaps work as well as the others if it could live in isolation. Each of those different ethics could reward its absolutization if isolated. Our problem is that we can't avoid the interaction between the three. And most of us have got so much mistake at stake in our own absolute, though we just cannot comprehend when there's another absolute in the picture. Now I've gone to all this length to talk about the ways in which the self can be valued. To try to make the point, which sounds so platitudinous, that we're different. By my very stumbling, I've think I've demonstrated how hard it is to ever think in another's frame of reference. I've tried to say, uh, even though indirectly, how unwarranted and how arrogant are our assumptions that we even understand ourselves, let alone that we understand somebody else. All that I am and do is built on my very own limited understanding of the self, as I see it. And all that you are is built on your own understanding of yourself. Now, I suspect that you came here because you believe, as I do, that we desperately need to communicate. I think one of the reasons we need to communicate is we need to learn a lot from each other. Another is that we've got to cooperate to survive. But every time we try to communicate and it gets difficult, I know I find plenty of good arguments at hand to avoid the awkwardness. You just can't hear and communicate with a man unless you can put himself, put yourself in his shoes. But that's at best only partially possible. So the best we can ever hope for is partial communication. So let me be very blunt, especially if you think you're a bit of a communication buff or that you're rather a sensitive human being. If you're in the habit of saying ever about anybody, poor kids, they're all mixed up, whether it's about other kids or someone who's much younger than you. Or if you say, oh, they'll change when they become a little better informed. Or if only those people had a bit more education. If you say, if you even think those things, you've got no chance of communicating. You might as well forget it. Because each of those thoughts indicates that you're not prepared to make the first step, which is to enter the other's frame of reference. I know that sounds tough. I firmly believe that. I recently witnessed an extraordinary example of this, a way in which self-concepts 
completely prevented communication before an audience of 150 people for a whole hour. You can only do that kind of thing when you're at a workshop situation. People won't put up with it for an hour, usually. A white conference leader had persuaded a member of the very radical black contingent to role play something with him. They were to pretend that they were one-time high school buddies who would now come to college together. And, but now they never really talk. And Whitey's trying to find out why. He begins with a puzzled statement, but we were such good friends in high school. And each time he said this, the response was, you thought we were. Were we really? Or how could I be your friend when you've abused my people so long? And those black answers came back every time he said, but we were such good friends in high school. All of the feedback from the black man really said the same thing, no matter what the word. I'm not relating to you because I'm black and I'm proud and I don't need you. His self just wasn't at stake. In fact, the worse things, the, the worse things became between them, the more confident he was that he and all his soulmates were right in rejecting nigger lovers like this white guy from Brooklyn. So long as each stayed within his own notion of the self, and they did, there could be no communication. Because he, he does think of himself, this white man, as an extremely liberal, open human being. Now, if you apply this to you and me, if we're confident about the self-sufficiency of what our group of humanity embodies, and that we don't need to hear and listen to what the rest of the world has to say, then we won't really communicate. A very simple way of finding out whether this is true, I think, is to ask whether you've been really overwhelmed by experiencing something marvelous and devastating about you and people really different from you recently. If you haven't, you should ask, well, then have I been communicating with anybody of another culture recently? Have I ever heard in addition to talking? Or have I just been, like most Americans, silent long enough to take my turn and talk? It's some consolation, you know, to realize that there is a good psychological reason for each of us shutting out the other's self-concept. Even the act of trying to communicate at least a slightly throws into question one's own sense of worth. The rock addict thinks the others are a bunch of crap, and each of the others operates on the assumption that he has worth in the terms which have been given and not questioned. But if we really communicate, the demand is made that we take seriously that there are some other ways in which people can be valued. And if there are, maybe the basis of my value is invalid. That's a pretty hard thought. I believe in intercultural and international educational endeavors in the groups that are sponsoring me being here because essentially they believe we ought to learn from other cultures. They start out with the assumption that we need each other, not as members of a mutual admiration society, but more than anything else to teach us each how to be more human. By their existence and their efforts, they say, if we were brave and imaginative enough to communicate across the different concepts of selves, we could learn so much that we might then succeed in living together, whether in this town or this world. Now, I don't want to replace all the goodwill in this world with tension, at least not all the time. But I would challenge any modern Westerner to be non-Western to the extent of seeking a little pain with his pleasure. I would challenge those from traditional societies to be non-traditional to the extent of imagining, if you could, one man, 
with no community. And I would challenge members of the youth culture to deny their affirmation of self long enough to feel themselves into those who habitually deny any self at all. That empathy is the essence of communicating with another human being. With it, there's less chance of misunderstanding and there's more chance that we'll hear what the other wants us to hear. Increasingly, I think, there are people who know that what I'm suggesting, although it's difficult, is not impossible. They're people who are learning because they are communicating. And in this speech, I've not tried to tell you how to communicate, but I've tried to be your interpreter. But finally, interpreters are no use, for each person has got to hear for himself and speak for himself. When we do, and believe there's a chance that we will learn, I know we'll then change, and I believe that as a result, the young will remain free, but they'll also be well fed. The traditional villages will be healthy as well as happy. And we Westerners will have not only plenty, but peace in ourselves and with other people. If we can move a little way in that direction, we'll have accomplished a great deal. Thank you very much. Uh, you have any question? You can stay back and uh, ask for the uh, and uh, the Dr. Smart can answer all your questions. And uh, we welcome all, everybody come to our workshop tonight uh, at uh, 10 p.m. at the Black Center. Thank you. I don't know whether you want to ask any questions in this format or privately, but if there are any.